If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd ask you to turn to the book of Psalms, Psalms 19. Uh, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Psalms 19, in the very first verse. The Bible says, the Psalm of David, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where the, their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is, which is as bridegroom coming out for, of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making, the wise, making wise the simple. I'd like to preach, the Lord be my helper this morning, on the thought, what does your testimony say? Dear Lord, we thank You, we praise You, and give You great glory and honor for simply sitting on the throne this morning and doing things all that are good. Lord, we praise You for that. Lord God, we pray this morning that You might meet with this Thy people here, Lord, that You would uh, that You would be lifted up, Lord, that You would come down and that You would meet with us and that You'd make Your Word uh, this morning a living Word to our hearts, that You'd call us to thrill in what You've given us. Lord God, we pray if there's lost here among us that you might speak life to them even today. Lord, that you'd make them to understand and know if they genuinely have a testimony or if they don't. We'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, when you begin to think about testimony, at least I do, I often think of court, uh, of the law of the land, and... I will say this, I don't agree with, you know, the credence before you give testimony in a court because, by, uh, because our court system says that you will swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. And we directly are advised and we're, 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 we're not to swear that way. It says not to swear by any name, much less the name of the great God Jehovah. But when you, when you think of that, it is your testimony. What you're giving, is it true? And, and, and the reason they do it that way is to add importance that the truth, that what you're saying, is a very weighty matter. Now, we live in a day and age where truth is immaterial. Uh, uh, somebody said, lie, as, lie to you is look at you. And, and the truth is just not important anymore. If you don't believe that, look at the, the trash that's on, on, the, on the TV now. Uh, CNN News, Central News Network. Listen, what they propagate is no more news than, than anything else. It, it, it's just a bunch of lies. But So when we begin to think of a testimony, and especially a testimony where you stand with God, we need to know that we're telling the truth. We need to understand. You know, if anything that's happened in my lifetime is this, is that truth has become almost valueless in most people's eyes. But listen, God knows the truth. And His truth is righteous. His truth, His truth. And listen, you know what? He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows the truth. He, he, he knows exactly as it is. And, and David had a very, a very sound understanding of this. And he begins his psalms, The heavens declare the glory of God. When you look out and you see the clouds rolling or you see the brightness of the sky, if you see the sun at nighttime, and he mentions the nighttime, you see all the stars in their courses doing exactly what they're supposed to do, where they're supposed to do it, and when they're supposed to do it, that declares the glory of God. Uh, that, that says that this couldn't have happened by mistake. It couldn't have been just an explosion somewhere. It happened by design and divine creation. See, uh, that declares His glory. 
In the New Testament, the Bible says because of that, in fact, that you're without excuse. You know, a lot of people want to get all bent out of shape about little people in Africa or something. You know what? The heavens themselves are trying to glory God, and they're just as guilty as I am. That's not real popular preaching, is it? But it's the truth. The heavens declare the glory. You know, uh, somebody once said to me, well, brother, there, what about people that's not ever even heard? I said, well, the best I understand, they're going to hell. Because you know why? God is righteous and He will not let sin into glory. And, and so we find then that uh, if we look out and see His handiwork, we see God. That, uh, verse 2, day unto day, uttereth speech. Now, it's not like speech we can hear, but you know what? Every morning I get up in the morning and go to the nursing home, you know what? The sun's going to be up and it's going to start me another brand new day and God is still in control. You know you know why the sun comes up each morning? It's because God guides it to do that. And you know what? One day, it won't come up anymore and on the very same token, the reason that it'll be blackness all around is by the hand of God. If you don't believe that, ask the Egyptians. They learned the hard way, did they not? And so we, we need to understand as we begin to think of a testimony that God is sovereign in all things and He knows. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. There's no place the sun doesn't shine. There's no place that the moon doesn't do its job. Verse 4. Their line, meaning the sun and the moon, their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. And so this very place around us is his tabernacle. It all there is a holy, mighty God in control of all things. Verse 6. Uh, uh, verse 5, excuse me. Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. And so he describes this as a, as a man, as a bridegroom that is ready to get the job done. You know, a bridegroom is a young man, a man that's new in his life. And it says here, as one that's getting ready to run his race, that, 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 is, that declares the glory of God. Uh, you know what? If I tell you something, it could be wrong. Right? But if God tells you something, it's always, always right. You know, uh, that's, why, that's why a lot of people uh, you know, don't believe in complete depravity. But I do. I've raised enough youngins to know that they come out of the wounds by uh, speaking lies, right? And so, I mean, as harsh as that may sound, it has to be just that way. You can depend on what God tells you. And so when we begin to think of our own personal testimony, you be sure you know where you stand with God. Verse 7, the law of God is perfect. Now, you know, that, that, that's a thing a lot of people want to set aside in the modern day. But you know what? The law of God is still perfect. It, it is complete. It is full. Uh, anything else that you can think of, you know, and, and you know, that's why a lot of Campbellite people don't want to read the Old Testament. It's because the law is perfect. They, they don't want to hear a truth that, 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 that screams for a perfect sacrifice, a complete sacrifice, right? So their little versions has your New Testament, Psalms, and Proverbs. That's all they need. But the Bible says here that the law is perfect. It's complete. You know, you know what the best thing about the law is? It fairly screams for a sufficient sacrifice. And, and that, that's why it is so good. And so, as David's writing this, he says, listen, the law is complete or without, without error, without a problem. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, we've been talking a little bit recently about conversion, and I do not think that it equ equates to salvation, because when, when P uh, the Lord told Peter... Peter, when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. He was already saved. But he needed some conversion. You know what? He was a coward. 
And God was fixing to make him be something besides a big mouth coward. He was he's fixing to give him some bravery. And, and so uh, I want you to see here, if you want to know something concerning the, uh, uh, the things of the Lord, that it says here that it, 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 the law is per perfect converting or changing the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. Now, uh, I want you to get that, that the testimony of the Lord is sure. It's dependable. It's something that you can rely on. And you know what? If you look around today, we, li we live in a thing where you can't, we live in a society you can't depend on much. People, I I've never lived in a day where people lie so easily. I mean, they, they don't even smile or bat an eye or nothing and be just filling you with lies. You know, uh, there was a time when even lost people cherished the truth. Uh, uh, you know, there was a man over at home, and if I said his name, y'all would all know him. He, but I'm not going to. He's dead now, anyway. And he had gambling parties every night up at his house. They lived next door to where we lived in Carlisle. And uh, about midnight, you'd hear all these things, all these cars and stuff coming off the hill where they lived. And, and, and it's every, every man in Carlisle up there gambling. And uh, you'd ask him, so uh, again, if I said his name, everyone of you know him. Where was you last night? I was getting drunk and fucking gambling. And you know, and, and that's a bad thing. But you know what? He told you the truth. I mean, he, he didn't lie and say, and say, oh, I'm just home with my wife watching TV. He said, I was getting, you know what? This man, despite what kind of person he was, he valued the truth. That, that's, not a, that's not a very valuable thing. So, uh, this morning when you began to think of your testimony, it really won't mean a whole lot to you. If you don't value the truth, if you enjoy lies, it's not going to help you much. But if you value the truth, and, and, and the truth is what is what you're interested in seeing, and the thing you're interested in knowing, then the truth is important to you. Now go with me to the Gospel of John, if you would. John chapter number 21. John 21, we're going to begin reading in verse 20. John 21, beginning in verse 20. The Bible, uh, uh, the Bible says this, And Peter turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, meaning John the Apostle, which also leaned on his, meaning Christ's breast at supper, and said, which is he that betrayeth thee? And Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Now what had happened is that uh, John, uh, first of all, he had a little jealousy right here. And uh, Peter was just a little bit jealous of John. And you know the only thing that really... Uh, John had that the others didn't was that he was humble. So humble was he really that he would not even write his own name in his own writing, the disciple from Jesus loved. And, and, you know, and you know why? Because he knew that that was really the only thing that valued that really he had anyway was the fact that Christ loved him. And, and so we find that Peter was just a little bit jealous of him and the reason why was he, he said, if I want you to live till I come again, you would. He said that to John, verse 22. And Jesus saith unto them, I'll, I will that he tarry till I come. What is that to thee? Following that, Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said, said not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? To thee? This is the disciple which testified of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. 
Now, Don, now John speaking of himself, and he's, he's, he's ending his, his uh, accounting of the gospel and of the ministry of Christ. He says this, I know that his testimony is true. Now, that's the first quality you better have in your testimony is that it's true. Now, you younger parents and people with grown kids like me, uh, you learn to tell when your children are lying, don't you? And as soon as they start, you're like, well, they're fixing to spin me some yarn because I know they're lying. Uh, uh, Bella coming to me, Mama said, and I said, well, did Mama say it because I'm fixing to go ask her and she, you know, her face hit the floor. Uh, you know why? Because I know she's lying. So the, the, very, the very key event is knowing that your testimony is true. Knowing that what you say, because you know what, I've heard some pretty flowery testimonies concerning redemption, and you know, they, they, you know they're going to be in a bad car wreck and all, all this crazy stuff. But is it true? What it really comes down to this, do you know Christ? And can you say that with a yes or a no, and it be true? See, because you can say anything. You, you, you got my, all my kids is raised in church. Listen, they know the right words. But that don't make it true. You see what I'm saying? This is a simple fact. Even if you're lost and on your way to a devil's hell, at least if you know that, you know it's true. Now, this is the problem in the modern day. Most people don't even know that. Or they have somebody telling them how good they are. Or you have somebody saying, well, don't you remember where you said the sinner's prayer? Well, first of all, where did they get that in the Bible? Uh, I've studied the Bible sincerely for over 30 years, and I've never seen the sinner's prayer of you. I mean, really. So again, the quality of testimony is this, that it must be true. And that, that, that really is what it all hinges on. If you can be honest with yourself enough and understand enough, are you saved or are you lost? Can you say uh, yes or no? Huh. Psalms 93. Psalms 93, just almost back where we were before. 93 in the first verse. Psalms 93 in the very first verse, the Bible says this, The Lord reigneth, He is clothed with majesty, the Lord is clothed with strength, is clothed with strength, wherewith He hath girded Himself, the world also established, and it cannot be moved. Now, I want to, I want to show you a couple of things. First of all, I want you to see the majesty of our Lord God, because listen, when we get to glory, uh, seeing Grandma and Mama and Daddy is going to pale in comparison in the person of the Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord God of Heaven, the great God Jehovah. Listen, Mama ain't going to mean a whole lot in the presence of deity. And a lot of people, you know, you remember that old foolish song, I want to be at Mama's grave. Well, listen, what I want to be is be at the feet of Jesus. That, that, that's what I want. And, and so we see that His, uh, His magnificent presence will really take full command and we'll see Him in a new and a brighter light. Also, I want you to see that He established this world and it will be. When God establishes something, it's going to be there. Now, uh, well, I understand the Scriptures. He's going to clean it all off one day. But He established it so it will be. You know, that's why... You know, the devil is really good at, at slipping counterfeits. But uh, if God establishes things, you can depend on it. Uh, in my worst rebellion to God, if somebody asked me if I was saved, I would have said yes. And you know why? Because He had assured me of that. I didn't, look, didn't know much about what the Bible ta taught. But I did know this. I knew that I was saved. And so, our God, and you know what I have found really? When you get, you know, like when you peel an onion, it just keeps coming off in layers and layers. When you get it down there to where people live, they know too. They just don't like to hear it. They know. 
They, they know if they're really uh, saved or if they're actually lost. That, uh, it is a revealed truth. And so we see that as well. Verse 2, Thy throne is established uh, thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than those of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Thy testimonies are very sure. Now, another thing about testimony... Uh, in addition to being true, you got to be sure. You know, I, I've never been in very many courts of law, but uh, I've been a couple times. I've been questioned on nursing cases, and what the opposing attorney loves to do. Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you certain that they want? And if they can ever trick you to start think to start doubting what you saw, then they got the upper hand. So in addition to your testimony being true, you got to be sure about it. You know what? Uh, very, very frequently, and y'all have all heard me quote this many times, that I, 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 I think it must make your calling and election sure. Because you want to be certain that you stand in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you sure? You know what? Uh, I don't have very many. I don't have very much confidence when I say, "Are you saved?" Well, I think I am. I, I, that that don't go very far. Are you sure? See, it, it is a certainty that 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 we look at what we have. So, if your testimony is true and you're sure, then you ought to be able to give a good sound testimony. Is that right? We we, we ought to be we ought to be able to say, "This is where I." Stand with the Lord. This is what the Bible says, and I'm standing on it. That's what we as the Lord's people ought to be able to do. Uh, Psalms 119, the long one. We're just going to read one verse, so don't get panicky over it. Uh, so, uh, Psalms 119. Uh, I want to read just verse uh, 14. Psalms 119 and verse 14. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. Now, what we ought to be able to do is rejoice in testimony. Now, uh, that's first of all something that most people, even my age, I'll be 50 if I live to December, I, a lot of people don't know of men giving good sound testimonies. You know what? It ought to thrill your heart when somebody says, let me tell you about the day the Lord saved me. Yeah. See, uh, I want my children to know. Uh, i got a brand new one. Bella would have to learn this all, but I know all my older children can say uh, they better be able to I know Dad saved. This is how he told me it happened. Or as much as you can know about somebody else. See, uh, I love the testimony, don't you? And it don't have to be, you know, it don't have to be all this grandiose stuff. You know, you know what the testimony of Lydia was? It's very simple, wasn't it? Whose heart the Lord opened. Pretty simple, wasn't it? But you know what? That stands even today as a testimony, doesn't it? So. Uh, you don't have to be on meth and delivered from it. Nothing like that. But what is testimony? A testimony that's sure. Uh, a testimony that your family and your church people can rejoice in. That is, uh, that what, that's what ought to be our desire. And then the writer says this, I desire that over all riches. Now, uh, I, saw my, I saw the day the Lord saved my dad. And y'all all know it. And, and, and Dad only lived six weeks after the Lord saved him. And uh, lived a pretty rough life. And, but what a wonderful testimony. And in addition to, you know, 
seeing him cry out for salvation, I tell you, a greater, a greater uh, testimony to to me than that was, and just beholding him saying a prayer was this. He taking me by the hand the day before he died and said, "Larry, it's all been in vain." He understood his life had been a complete waste. Yeah. That's a good testimony, you know. It's a sad testimony, but it's a good testimony. See, we we need things like that, don't we? We, 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 we need to understand where we stand with God. You know why uh, uh, people die today in somewhat uncertainty? It's simply this. It's because they, they, don't, know, they, they don't have a sound testimony. Now, I want to look very quickly at the book of Acts. And we're going to look at the conversion of Paul. And then a couple of times when he, uh, he gave a testimony of such. Acts chapter 9, and we'll go very quickly through this. Acts chapter 9, in the very first verse, the Bible says this, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Now, I, I want to I mention two things for you, and all of you know it, I understand that, but just as a reminder, number one, did it seem that he was seeking God? And I would have to say no. Now, on the flip side, I'll say this. He heard the gospel from a man named Stephen. And uh, he stood right there and watched a man die for his faith. And you know what? Stephen didn't invite anybody to say the sinner's prayer, did he? In fact, all he said is, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And you know what would have been the greatest testimony to me if I'd been there and I'd been Paul, I think? Is, is that part where it says, and he fell asleep. <laughs> and that, listen, that wasn't getting conked on the head with a rock. That was falling asleep in the peace of God. You know, when the stones begin to fly and you have the peace of God to sleep, what else did you want? That's good stuff, isn't it? And, and so that, that no doubt lodged in, in, in Paul's mind. And he, and he certainly had heard the gospel. And that's why I'm missionary and not primitive Baptist. Is because I believe in spreading the gospel. And that's exactly what he heard here. But now he wasn't in the frame of mind of seeking God. Verse 4 says, And he fell on the earth and heard a voice saying unto uh, him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, uh, people, listen to this. If you don't get nothing else out of this, if the pricks are not there, you're probably still lost. <laughs> you probably still lost. Because uh, if He's never golden you, if He's never convicted you, if you've never felt guilty of His own blood, probably you're still lost. Probably you're still lost. Because see, the pricking of the Holy Ghost is what's left out today. That's why I'm not Armenian. That's not what I'm going to... That's why I don't take someone my daughter's age and try to repeat some kind of foolish prayer. Because it, it leaves out the work of God. You know what? If I could save people, I'd save everybody in this building tonight. But I just can't. Yeah. I don't have the ability to do that. And, and so then we, we as the Lord's people, I think it's a very noteworthy that we should ask us when we give a testimony, when we, when we tell people of the goodness of God, do you have these essential pricks have you been golden by the Lord God of heaven? Verse 6. And he trembling and astonished and said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Now, the second thing is the result of salvation. And, and listen, I don't think it was the a few days later when he was at Simeon's and, and got baptized. I don't think that was his redemption, but I believe he was already saved because, see, the result of redemption is this, is a willing vessel. And he said, what would you have me to do? And man, he was ready to go. If you don't believe that, read Isaiah chapter 6. 
Here I am, send me, send me. See, when, when you spend time with God, you're, you're different than you were before. And we have no reason whatsoever to think that someone's saved and still out there living like dogs. Right? Kind of hard stuff, ain't it? But it, but, it, but it is true. And so then, we, we know the life of Paul. A few days later, he was baptized and he stayed there at Antioch for, for, for uh, as much as two years with that church leader, learning the truth of the things of God. That, that's what he did. Now go me to Acts 22 and verse 5. Acts 22 and verse 5. Uh, this was some years later. Some suggest as much as 15 years later. Uh, it says, uh, and, and uh, Paul is fixing to appear before a judge, and as also high priest doeth bear witness in all the estate of the elders for whom I have received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem to be, for to be punished, or for to be punished. Now, uh, Paul is recalling again. He said, listen... I was on my way to Damascus and I was going to, I was going to arrest everybody that named the name of Jesus. Now I was going to take them back to Jerusalem and they were going to stand trial. That was my plan. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh to Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from me, uh, there shone from heaven a great light round about me, and I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Now, I want you to get a couple of things. Number one, I understand that, the, that he saw the Lord Jesus in the flesh because he was to be an apostle. And that's a requirement to be an apostle. That's why the apostolic office is closed. That's when, why you can approach Pentecostal people, don't mean that bad, and say, well, when's the last time you saw Jesus? Because... You have to do that to be an apostle, right? If you don't believe that, read Acts chapter 2 and it gives you the qualifications to the apostolic office. And then I also want you to see here that he, uh, he said, uh, in reviewing that, he said, I heard, I heard, but nobody else did. He said, everybody saw the bright light, but I'm the only one that heard. See, that's every day. That's why on Sunday morning and Wednesday night I'm up here preaching. And you know what? I really have to say this. And I understand preaching is for the encouragement of the saints. I understand that. But the, you know what? Uh, a lot of times, a lot of times more than not, I preach and the light don't go on. Right? I preach and nobody hears in the sense that they to be to be to be saved. See, everybody there saw something, but only one individual heard it. Couldn't believe that that's a common occurrence. Follow the life of Timothy. Paul had really preached a lot. One individual. And really, now this make you think about your parenting. See, he had been nurtured all along the way by Lois and Eunice, hadn't he? So when he heard the gospel, it's just like this. Open his heart. See. Remember Lydia. No drama. No, no, no Billy Graham uh, evangelist. They down there washing the clothes. And Paul came by and said, Do you know Jesus? Just that simple. And you know what? There was more people down there besides Lydia, but she's the only one it said whose heart the Lord opened. Now, that says, that this says that to me, keep going. Keep trying. Keep preaching. You know what? I don't know. <laughs> In the rest of my ministry, if I live another 50 years, if the Lord will ever save one more individual, but I'll keep trying.
I'll keep preaching because that's what I'm commanded to do. Now, what about your testimony? What about what you're trusting? What about what uh, what the Lord's said to you? See, uh, I've never seen the Lord Jesus Christ. I've never heard Him audibly, audibly speak, but I know He spoke to me. And that's what you must have if you're genuinely saved. But a judge came standing down at Tennessee Ridge. You went right past the place where the Lord saved my soul. And uh, Carlisle Free Will Baptist. And at least they have the brass to put it across the door. They, they say, you know, uh, Southern Baptist is free will. But they just won't put it that way. But that's what they believe. <laughs> that's what they And I don't know why. You know what? Everybody say, well, are you sure you're saved? Yeah, I'm sure I'm saved. You know, this is just the thing. You don't have to be a sovereign grace preacher and preaching right. to save your soul. That's right. And uh, Brother Artis Winnick, he's still preaching today. 82 years old. He's the same age as my mother. Still pastoring the Free Will Church over in Cumberland City. And I love to go by and say, Brother, I appreciate you preaching that day. Uh, yeah, you know what? I've told you before, I went there to that little vacation Bible school to make some kind of craft to bring home to my mother. And went down there and came home a regenerate person. Mm. See, that, 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 that has to be the difference. And you know what? If you don't have something to compare, make your call in the election sure. See, uh, if you've never spoken to God, and I say more importantly like this, if the Holy Ghost never has spoken to you, you are still lost. And that, that's not real popular preaching, but see, how could you know someone intimately that's never spoken to you? Right? So that's what it really hinges on, is not what you've said, but what Christ has done. Has He ever really spoke life to you? What is your testimony? When you stand before God one day, you know what? And that, that's the scary truth. I'm going to stand there on the merit of Christ. That's a, that's a glorious thing. But according to the Scripture, some will say, did I not prophesy in thy name? In other words, did I not preach? And He'll say unto them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never did. So that means we can be deceived, does it not? So do you know Him? Do you know Him intimately? That is the question.